Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to your favorite YouTube channel, ATP, Ask the Pastor. Today, we're going to deal with two questions about different Bible translations. Dear Pastor, I have a question about the Geneva Bible of 1599. I know you prefer KJV in KJV, but I'm curious as to your thoughts about the Geneva translation, since I myself don't know much about it, since I use German and English interchangeably, ESV and the Luther 1545-1984 edition. Well, the Geneva Bible was wildly popular. Uh, it was completed uh, 51 years before the King James Version was published. Uh, it superseded the Great Bible of 1539, and the Great Bible was uh, the first authorized English translation of the Scriptures. It consisted of Tyndale's translation of the Greek New Testament and then parts of the Old Testament that he had completed from Hebrew the rest of it then was Coverdale's translation uh, from the Vulgate and German translations. So the Great Bible of 1539 wasn't a complete translation from the original languages. The Geneva Bible, though, uh, was the Puritans' response to the Great Bible. So during the reign of Mary, uh, many Puritans fled to Geneva, the home of John Calvin and the Swiss Reformation. While in Geneva, the Puritans put together the Geneva Bible. And so this was the first English Bible in which the entire Old Testament was translated from Hebrew, unlike its predecessor, the Great Bible. Now, as far as evaluating the Geneva Bible, I can't uh, address the translation itself. It would be interesting to compare the Puritans' revisions to Tyndale's and Coverdale's translations to see if their Calvinism affected the translation itself. Uh, the preface to the 1560 edition of the Geneva Bible stated that, that those translations required greatly to be perused and reformed. So I'm very curious to see just how precisely those translations were reformed, no pun intended, um, and if that reform then were merely linguistic or whether it was theological as well. Now aside from the translation itself, the study notes of the Geneva Bible, uh, they are what betray the Calvinism of the editors and compilers of the Geneva Bible. So Bruce Metzger pointed out um, that the uh, in the 1560 edition of the Geneva Bible, the note on Romans 9.15 blatantly teaches a double predestination by an arbitrary and absolute decree. It reads, As the only will and purpose of God is the chief cause of election and reprobation, so his free mercy in Christ is an inferior cause of salvation, uh, and the hardening of heart and interior cause of damnation. Uh, Metzger goes on to show that the Geneva Bibles printed after 1587 taught a Calvinian uh, perseverance of the saints. In its comment on Luke 22, 32, Jesus tells Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And the comment the Puritans inserted on that, on that verse was, it is through the prayers of Christ that the elect uh, do never utterly fall away from the faith. And that is for this cause that they should stir one another up. Another scholar who's done a lot of good work in this area is uh, Ruth Magnuson Davis. Uh, she has demonstrated that the uh, 1590 edition of the Geneva Bible, uh, that its study notes inveigh heavily against ceremonies in the church, uh, calling them outward and hypocritical, uh, which is a typical Calvinist view of adiaphora in the church. Uh, one example uh, is the note on Psalm 50, verse 3. Uh, there it condemns musical instruments in the church, claiming that while they were commanded in the Old Testament, uh, they were abolished in the New, something which I myself cannot find in the New Testament anywhere. Since many of the Bible's notes uh, run contrary to the very scriptures that they claim to explain and spread the Calvinian error, uh, I think with regard to the Geneva Bible, it's simply best just to avoid it. Uh, you can acknowledge it as a historical artifact. Uh, it was a translation that, the, um, uh, that was brought over to America on the Mayflower. It was a translation uh, used by William Shakespeare. So it's an interesting historical artifact. But I think uh, for actual uh, personal, uh, devotional, and corporate worship use, uh, I think it's best just to consign it to the history books. Now, question number two, our second question then, deals with uh, the Knox translation. Dear Pastor, uh, since your series on Bible translations has been my favorite, 
I would like your opinion on the Knox Bible. It's my own preferred translation, but please don't let that stop you from being too critical. All I ask is your honest opinion. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the Knox Bible is a translation by Monsignor Ronald Knox, an English theologian in the early 1940s. Now, KnoxBible.com says that the Knox Bible is, quote, translated from the Latin Vulgate and compared with the Greek and Hebrew texts, end quote. So right out of the chute, we have to loop, uh, lump this translation in the same category as uh, translations such as the Dewey Rhymes version, because it's a translation of a translation. Even the word translation is a bit of a misnomer with the Knox Bible. I took a look at just a couple verses um, and examined them, and the Knox Bible appears to me to be much more of a paraphrase than it is an actual translation. So for instance, I looked up John 3, 16, 17, and 18. The Vulgate is translated into English like this. For God loved the world in such a way that he gave his only begotten Son, that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world may be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not judged, but whoever does not believe has been judged already, for he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now that's the Vulgate translated into English. Now compare this with Knox's translation of the same verses. He writes, God so loved the world that he gave up his only begotten son, so that those who believe in him may not perish but have eternal life. When God sent his son into the world, it was not to reject the world, but so that the world might find salvation through him. For the man who believes in him, there is no rejection. The man who does not believe is already rejected. He has not found faith in the name of God's only begotten Son. So the big discrepancy here with Knox is uh, the word judge is rendered reject. Uh, and reject isn't in the semantic field of the Latin Eudicio. Um, Knox's note on John 3.17 doesn't help matters at all either. The note that uh, Knox uh, leaves states, to reject. The word here used in the Greek may mean to judge or to separate, and is perhaps used here with a certain play of sense upon the two meanings. So the translation judged conveys the meaning of the Greek and Latin Vulgate adequately. But Knox's insertion, or rather replacement of that with the word reject here, and his explanation of it, only muddies the reading of the text, in my opinion. Uh, another verse I looked at was Romans 4, verse 5. Here, an English translation of the Vulgate would go something like this. But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness according to the purpose of God's grace. Now, here's Knox's attempt. When a man's faith is reckoned virtue in him, according to God's gracious plan, it is not because of anything he does, it is because he has faith. Faith in the God who makes a just man of the sinner. So Knox remarks in the note that the phrase, according to God's gracious plan, doesn't appear in any Greek manuscript, you know, outing it as a, a complete vulgate corruption of the text. My big problem with this paraphrase, though, is the word virtue. Uh, the word is righteousness or justice. Uh, and, and again, all Knox accomplishes here with this is an obscuring of an otherwise perfectly clear verse. Uh, the Knox Bible was, was officially sanctioned uh, by the Roman Catholic Church for use in the liturgy and home, uh, but one interesting thing about it is it never really became popular because it was published just after Pius XII's encyclical, uh, which called for new vernacular translations of the scripture from the original languages, from the original Greek and Hebrew, uh, rather than translations based on the Vulgate. Uh, overall, you know, to be honest, since you asked for that, I don't care for the Knox Bible. First, because it's a translation of a translation, and a corrupt translation of that. Uh, it incorporates Greek and Hebrew texts uh, to a minimal degree, but it relies way too heavily on the Latin Vulgate. Second, uh, you know, I read somewhere that uh, it's a much freer translation than the Dewey Rhymes, and I'm beginning to see that the more I look at it. Uh, that's just a really nice saying, way of saying that it's a paraphrase rather than an actual translation. So since you asked for the honest opinion, um, you know, you can may continue to use it, of course, uh, but I don't care for it. I don't think it passes muster as something that Christians really ought to be using uh, for private or for corporate use.
There's your two questions on Bible translations. We'll see you next time on ATP.